tried to get more radio content this year at, at Hope, because there's a lot of crossover between folks that like to hack radio and hack computers and hack other phones and other things like that. So um, I'm, uh, I'm part of that scene. And uh, I met uh, Pete Tredish, what, like 20 years ago? More. More than 20 years ago, back in Philadelphia, Radio Mutiny had this radio, this pirate station on the air. I heard. I'm like, this is interesting. I got to get involved. So we uh, we work together on this, and you know, they'll tell, he'll tell you the whole long story of how Radio Mutiny um, played a key part in uh, a community radio movement that led to where we are today, where a hacker space was able to start a legal FM broadcast station. So um, we have Saint and Petri Dish, and uh, this is going to be a really interesting talk. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Bernie. Uh, so I'm going to just start with a little bit of background on FM, uh, just so that we can, uh, uh, you know, just to sort of catch up, make sure everyone in the room is in the same place about the history of it all. So uh, the FM band was allocated in the late 40s. Uh, you know, the first radio was AM broadcasting in the in the in the mid 1920s, and and FM came along. Uh, there were three big differences with FM. One was that it it had better sound. Uh, it just sounded a, a whole lot better. Another was that it it really uh, was much less susceptible to interference than AM was. Uh, another big difference was that it had only a line of sight range, so there's no such thing as an FM station that really goes more than 40, 50, 60 miles, basically out to the horizon. Occasionally there'll be like weird atmospherics, but, but basically it's a, it's a local medium. And the third thing was that there was a, a band set aside uh, called the non-commercial band between 88 and 92, because most of radio had become so commercialized that people felt the need for there to be like a public park uh, on the FM band, like a place where it wasn't just about making the most profit. And that was where a lot of colleges, a lot of nonprofit organizations uh, sort of stepped in and started making, uh, making radio. Uh, over, at first, they didn't really know what to do with FM. In fact, some stations had to give away FM radios in order to get people to listen to it. Uh, and a lot of AM stations would just simulcast over, over FM. But by the 70s, 80s, it became a, a very powerful and, uh, and, and pretty dominant medium. And so, uh, and it started running out of space. And so it became more, there became more and more conflict when it came to trying to get a radio station. In fact, in the non-commercial part of the band, the conflict became so bitter and, uh, and legalistic that they started, that all the processes were broken and it became impossible to get uh, an FM non-commercial license around late 1980s or so. And in fact, there was no way to get one between about 1987, 1988, and 2007. So in the context of this, uh, and of course, in, the begin in, in that time, nobody wanted to have small radio stations. You know, most people that want to get into radio want to build a giant empire and have like the entire world listening to them. Um, but there, there came to be a group of people that started thinking, you know, um, just like you don't have like a single national government, there's like more than just the president. There's like the state level, there's the local level, there's city government, there's PTAs. Wouldn't it make some sense to have like radio that is devoted to these like local things? Because your, right. your citywide New York NPR affiliate cannot cover like your local PTA board election or who's running for dog catcher. But, but a, like a smaller neighborhood radio station really could do that. And there were a lot of spaces on the dial that were left that were really being not used because no one thought of them as profitable enough. And so into this gap stepped a, a pirate radio movement in the early 90s. Um, I won't go too far into that uh, except to say that uh, there was a <clears throat> kind of a uh, an amazingly crazy and audacious uh, anti-war activist named Stephen Dunifer, who uh, was an electrical engineer, and he he built himself a pirate radio station and a backpack, and was was broadcasting without a license. And when he got caught, the National Lawyers Guild Committee on Democratic Communications made a pretty amazing argument that yes, the FCC can limit the First Amendment rights of of 
of who has radio broadcast licenses, but it has to do it in the way that's the least harmful to the First Amendment. And so uh, the judge in the case was like, whoa, I hadn't really thought about it. Yeah, Mr. Donifer can keep on broadcasting. So there was this really crazy time between about 93 and 98 where like the FCC was pretty much unable to enforce its rules against pirate radio. And into that gap stepped about a thousand pirate radio stations that started operating around the country because we all knew that if anyone was gonna to go to jail, it would be Stephen first. And, <laughs> and, and that, that made us all bolder than we would have ordinarily been. So uh, that case was also in the case, in, in, in the context of a major shift in how the media was owned and operated and controlled. There was the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which got rid of <clears throat> almost all the limitations on ownership of, of radio stations, and so you ended up, you know, back in, back in the old days, you know, no one could own more than 20 radio stations. And really, to like, to most people, that sounds like plenty. But to Clear Channel, that sounded like a, a drastic uh, limitation on their freedom of speech. They didn't have the freedom to repeat themselves on a thousand channels across the country. So um, what they, uh, what the Telecom Act did was it got rid of all those, a lot of those limitations, and you saw local diversity in media go down, local ownership go down dramatically, minority ownership go from the whopping 3% that it was down to about 1.5% in the course of just a couple years. And that really sort of turned some heads at the FCC, and they started looking at the pirates not only as, as a, a pretty severe legal problem for them, but also in some ways as part of the solution. And they started saying, gosh, well maybe we actually should license some of these small frequencies that we otherwise thought were kind of garbage frequencies that no one else would want in the first place. And uh, so um, around that time was when my station was busted, the, the station that, that, um, that Bernie and I worked on. Uh, and uh, at that point, uh, a group of us started a, a group called Prometheus Radio Project, which <clears throat> we were kind of dealt a weird hand. Uh, you know, a, a lot of us probably would have preferred to stay pirates forever. But on the other hand, we started realizing that actually almost no matter what we did, there would be, there would be a legalization. And these frequencies that we were using were going to be given out. And so if we did not prepare social justice movements, workers' m movements, immigrants' rights groups, the kinds of groups that we wanted to see on the air, all these stations would get scooped up by religious fundamentalists and, and, and translators. So uh, that was the moment where my own personal life got a lot more boring. It went from, you know, pirate radio and swords and parrots and eye patches to teaching people how to fill out a lot of forms and, and put, uh, you know, put these stations on the air legally. So we spent a couple years in Washington trying to sort out how the rules were going to work. And uh, in 2000, they passed a new set of rules called the Low Power FM rules. And initially, they were going to give out a lot of frequencies uh, around the country. But uh, the broadcasting industry got so furious that they were beaten by you know, radio pirates and anarchists and, and whoever that they went to Congress and they said, Congress, the FCC, has their smoking crack. They have made a terrible, terrible mistake. And they gave out all these licenses to all these flakezoids. You know, like what on earth were they thinking? So within about six months of us winning and the FCC starting to give out these licenses, Congress passed a bill as part of uh, an appropriations rider, a sneaky like sort of uh, 11th hour thing where they took away all of the radio stations that would be given out in urban areas in the United States. And so there were, although Low Power FM went forward, there were no channels that were allowed in the top 50 urban markets. And there was, you know, most small towns that might have had six, seven channels available, they had maybe one. And so it would become a fight between the civil rights group and the evangelical church, even though that there, there were like plenty of frequencies that were perfectly usable. So um, I, what I didn't know at the time, which I later learned, on average it takes an uh, industry trade group about six to nine months to get something that it really wants from Congress. And on average it takes a citizen's organization working with grassroots mobiliza mobilization and you know, direct um, you know, constituent meetings and all that sort of thing. It takes about 10 years to pass. So one thing if you're ever thinking about 
you know, regulations and technology and legislation is that's kind of how it works. That's how they win is whatever your demand is, make sure it's going to still be worthwhile 10 years later and it's still going to make a difference. Um, so, uh, so what we ended up doing was we spent the next 10 years building a whole lot of radio stations in very small towns, not in New Orleans, but in Appaloosas, Louisiana, not in Portland, Oregon, but in Woodburn, Oregon, and working with a lot of small groups and, and building enough of a movement and a, like a, enough of a, uh, of a group to, to pass the legislation to allow uh, low power FM into, into larger urban areas. We did that in 2011, and uh, it took the FCC about two years to, to really go through the law and take notice and comment and implement the new regulations. And so in 2013, there was a filing window for more low power FM stations. Uh, and this time it did include the cities. Now, the FM band is, is limited. Uh, there was never any question about that. There's never room for more than 40, 50, depending how big the metropolitan area is. There's never really more room for more than 40, 50, 60 radio stations without causing interference to each other. And in some places, that's plenty. Uh, but in some places like like New York or, or Miami or Los Angeles or, or some of those places, there, there are never going to be as many FM channels as there are people that, you know, that could do a good job of doing something with them. So um, what, what we managed to win was a set of, of technical rules where there were about two to four channels in most major cities. New York was the exception. There are only, I think, one or two channels that were made available in New York City. And uh, Los Angeles, uh, there were 35 applicants, uh, no, 32 applicants for just one channel uh, in Los Angeles. And so it was a giant, uh, giant mess, a giant com competition between all of these different groups that, that wanted to be on the air. A couple of them managed to find a second channel in a different part of the city, but still there were all these groups that really should have been collaborating and should have been partners, but instead at this point are all, you know, well, a, a coalition emerged of a bunch of them that, that all decided that they were only going to be nice to each other and share the airwaves, but there were also a bunch of others that were like more like bad actors that just tried to like tattle on the FCC to each other and, 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 uh, and try, to, uh, try to take each other down. Um, so at this point, uh, with the current FCC, there's almost no interest in low power FM. Uh, the current FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, who most of you have heard is trying to uh, take away net neutrality, he has really never really talked about this, no, no real interest. He, and uh, the only thing he does want to do is he wants to give a bunch of channels away to AM stations uh, that, that are trying to get onto the FM band. So at this point, uh, there's no LPFM <coughs> window uh, in the works. Probably won't be for who knows, three years, five years, eight years, 10 years. And also the fact of the matter is if you're in any urban area, the best channels have already been given away. Um, so there, there are not a lot more opportunities. What there are, though, is uh, there's about 2,200 low power FMs on the air around the United States. Uh, just about every state has at least 50, 60, 70, 100 of them. And uh, you know, of the LPFMs that exist, uh, probably about 40% are religious. Uh, that, you know, they are involved with like these satellite networks that are sort of like this, like, you know, <clears throat> give me your money or you're going to burn in hell sort of programming. Um, but uh, a lot of the rest of them are amazing organizations, groups that um, I'm really thrilled to, to work with. And uh, a lot of uh, groups for recent immigrants, a fair number of colleges have them. Uh, a lot of uh, social justice organizations, environmental groups, and so that's the, the kinds of groups that, that, uh, that we do our work with. Um, so uh, I would just say, you know, if, if you're interested in getting involved with Low Power FM, the moment is past to start your own, but if you want to participate in one, there's a zillion, and there's a zillion that would probably love to have you involved, have you, um, you know, create programming, have you, you know, create technical solutions for all kinds of the, like, really interesting technical problems that, that uh, radio stations have. 
uh, in order, order to make them work better, make them go farther, you know, bring them on, on to, into podcasting and into the internet. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot to do. So um, that went. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. And I'd love to help out and take whatever content you have and put it on the air and, of course, the internet. When I first, when I first got the opportunity from Todd Urich to uh, create an LPFM for the hackerspace, I'm like, oh, sweet. Does anyone listen to FM anymore? Like, is that a thing? <laughs> of all my friends, we, we, we all stream our music. We, we don't use that much FM radio. I mean, okay, I'll, 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 I'll do that kind of as a lark, and then I got into it, and wow, these people are very serious about what might be a dead whale carcass of FM radio. Um, they're serious about it. Okay, well... Um, so, yeah, yeah, it might take a really long time for you to get an opportunity to get into making your own LPFM for your hack space or for your community. Um, but instead of going into things entirely blind, uh, as I did, I, I wish I had actually gone around to some of my existing LPFMs, like the college and just volunteered as a DJ, just learned how their tech stack works, just didn't jump in entirely naive two feet first, you know. I'm about as naive as um, Petrie is experienced. <laughs> and it's not good. <laughs> so um, Prometheus is a great place to start. Um, you can talk to us. I've been there, I can tell you what I've done and not to do that. <laughs> At least not to do some of it. Um, and he can, he can give you a much more in-depth thing. Common Frequency is a great place to get an LPFM. I don't know that they've done much since 2013. Oh, they're very active. Oh, they, they are? Okay, yeah. all right. I'm, I'm completely mistaken. But they, they, they will help you get an LPFM uh, when that window opens again. Um, you can see your local LPMs, LPFMs at this link, um, and Petrie's uh, uh, site is I am a radio, HTTP I am a radio, so you can check that out. All right, so this is what we did. Um, let's see, do I have time for this? Okay, yes, awesome, I do. Let's let's uh, blunder forth. Um, so. I know. Uh, um, let's just go to this one. I actually used to have this up in a tab, and then I let my uh, thing die. So, um, because I'm smart like that. So heck, if I can do it, you can. I mean, yeah, for sure, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So here's kind of the project log of how we went through, and I'm just going to spend maybe not even five minutes on this, but uh, this is the trials and tribulations of starting up an FM radio station relatively un, uh, uninformed. Okay, entirely uninformed. <laughs> so my moniker is Saint, but I'm, I used to be nearly militant atheist. Now I'm just, I, I'm not particularly religious one way or the other. Um, so, uh, no worries, I, I, I don't have a problem with religion, really, as long as it's, anyways, I'm getting off track. So, okay, we got a 107.9 approved by the FCC in October 1st of 2013. It took us until February of this year to get it up, and we, we did that through extensions. It was difficult. Um, we were going to put it on the U.S. Bank, we weren't allowed to... Oh, bugger. Um, let's see. Yeah, screw it. We'll do it live. <laughs> all right. I'm sorry. Um, all right. Um, let me just jump back here and represent. What is going on with you, you? Confused little machine. You want me to take it for a minute while you yeah, get sure, that? Please. No, 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 no. You keep the computer because right. I'm hopeless with that. All right, I yeah. could just talk for a minute while you do that. Um, 
I think, you know, one real interesting thing is, uh, you know, in terms of the, the, the dying whale carcass of FM, I am completely blown away that people are still listening to, to FM at this time. Uh, you know, we were just taking a look at some of the statistics around it. And while the people that I know are overwhelmingly not listening to FM at this point, uh, you know, my housemates or, or a lot of people that, that I work with, uh, you know, the latest numbers that we found, 93% uh, of Americans listen to FM every week. Um, and in terms of the time spent with audio, 54% of Americans, uh, no, 54% of the time that people spend with audio is with AM and FM radio, um, as opposed to about 16% of people's time they spend with their own tapes and records and CDs and MP3s and that sort of thing. Right. About 15% listen to streaming, uh, some form of live, live streaming, either on YouTube or on Pandora. And about 2% of time spent listening is spent with, with podcasts. So why on earth are, still, are people still listening to FM when there are all these you know, technical possibilities that are you know, in lots of ways way superior to FM in terms of like some of their capabilities? And I'll leave the answer to that until, because you got yours working. Good. All right. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I was just going to go through the Hackad Hack Hackaday I IO um, logs and show you. I figured that'd be the easiest and quickest. That was a mistake. Um, so essentially, I'll sum it up in, in 30 seconds. We moved four times, uh, were evicted once. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was exciting. We, we had to get, it was actually relatively easy to get the federal paperwork done, but the city paperwork was extraordinarily difficult. Um, we we um, had, had fun, and we eventually ended up uh, using our friends to um, take care of the hacker space when we got kicked out for a full year until we could buy our own place, and then we rented a tower instead of put the tower on our building because we're downtown, but that also means down in a gully in town, and that's not a great spot for a transmitter. So uh, um, we bought an $8,000 transmitter. There are $2,000 transmitters on eBay. They're apparently illegal because they don't have a magic stamp that says that they're legitimate. They're from China, and their tolerances are Fantastic, <laughs> um, but we we can't use them. They need a magic stamp. Um, we we got a fairly nice EAS emergency alert system, an NDEC, I should say, an NDEC too, um, and we sprung for a decent cable. Uh, but we stuck with it, and we then started in the technical areas of creating the radio room. Um, now. We're all absolutely brilliant people, and we're always entirely on task, ahead of time, and under budget. <laughs> so, yeah. So we created the super advanced radio control and storage mix room, um, also known as sarcasm. <laughs> this is me in my radio room with my like two-month-old daughter at the time, and. <laughs> Um, I'm using mix, which is all I know. It's it's for mixing DJ or mixing parties, you know. Um, and I'm playing that out over the airwave. It's it's really smooth and it's really fantastic, but it has limited scheduling ability, which is what you really want. Uh, but I'm so happy and naive, just like now. <laughs> this reminds me of now. <laughs> all right, so. <laughs> Um, here's our here's a glimpse of our master schedule. Uh, I just thought you might be vaguely interested in seeing kind of the content we put up. Uh, we got permission from Stank Dog to broadcast Hacker Public Radio, which is filled with swear words and awesome. So uh, after hours or heavily edited, <laughs> we have nerd news, which. It's kind of fun. Tech Talk, I think, is actually copyrighted, so I can't do that. I can't do Tech Talk. I think it's copyrighted. So we're 
We're probably going to do TikTok tech talks. Maybe that's more different. Maybe that's different enough, and they'll just be faster versions of tech talks that are just more information dense. Um, we play a lot of EDM and classical because that's just, you know, obviously goes hand in hand. <laughs> And we, we found uh, our lawyer who supposedly had the complaint to kick us out. Um, he didn't. Uh, he uh, has been creating laws online, so he's been uh, translating the laws it takes uh, into account with uh, uh, the new age of uh, computers, how, how the law ties into computers. All right, so how do you connect all these things? You have, a ten, uh, you have your antenna and cable and EAS and transmitter, and they all seem to plug together. Wait, no, they don't. It's, this isn't Legos. Oh, um, so I'm, I'm of the generation when building a computer meant essentially you can put Legos together. <laughs> Good job. And you can read like basic uh, bus speeds. Good job. Um, here's, here's how we did it. So we had our antenna up on top of a uh, Roan uh, 25G uh, guide tower, um, and it just had some fancy helix, heliax? Heliax. Heliax cable, heliax equivalent cable that went to our transmitter. Um, I've never seen the cable before in my life. It's, it's like half an inch thick, and it just has fantastic... Uh, 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 Sigh. <laughs> Moving on to the end deck. The end deck is going to uh, uh, give out those <laughs> messages you get on the FM radio telling you that you're about to be crushed by a tornado or something, right? Um, so <laughs> it, it gives you those emergency broadcast systems. It hooks to the internet and it hooks to uh, um, our uh, laptop, our server which is just a laptop that we set on top of the transmitter because it's, I mean, <laughs> you don't need much. Um, we ended up using IceCast. Um, that took a long, um, drawn out, panicked uh, month to figure out because <laughs> we didn't start with it. We started using Google Hangouts and a virtual audio cable, which essentially, it's like if you plugged in your microphone in, or your speaker into your line in, you know, with a audio jack, only it does it virtually so you don't have to waste physical ports. Um, so then anything we played out ended up being recorded and sent through Google Hangouts to our server. Problem with that, Google Hangouts isn't meant to run 24 seven. <laughs> so just, just in case you, you're wondering, <laughs> Um, we tried the same thing with Skype. Um, it, w it would work out, but it'd drop out periodically in the middle of the night, and we'd have dead air. Um, so we eventually switched to Butt, which is the uh, client to send to IceCast. Um, and the advantage about IceCast is it's really easy to create a radio internet radio station with IceCast. So. The fact that we haven't done it is only due to our brilliance and our ability to stay on time and under budget. So, and then we switched to radio DJ instead of mix. Mix is really awesome, but it, it can't schedule very well, uh, to my knowledge. Um, and of course, we SSH into our system. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go over this really quick because it doesn't really matter too much. Um, uh, this, I'm just going to go over some screenshots of how, how I had to file. You'll notice that I had to file a couple amendments here. Um, and this is just an example of uh, section one on the form 318, 319 uh, uh, permission. I'm just going through these so you can look at them on a YouTube later and have them for reference. I'll, ju I'll just mention that um, the guy that designed the FCC's website, yeah. uh, I saw him talk recently, and he was like, I designed an awesome website for the FCC in 1998, and it's still the same one. <laughs> yeah, you might look, oh, do I have the URL? It's like ws.exe, yeah, there we go. Um, so it's like, <laughs> there's the URL. Just. Winning, <laughs> so 
but you know, it, it, is, it, it is a very functional website and it's still running fine today, so kudos to him, I guess. I mean, yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, I haven't done that. <laughs> I don't know anyone else who has either. So um, the forms are kind of long. Um, get help. Uh, get lots of help. There's lots of people to help you. I mean, figuring out a 26-page application can be kind of tricky, especially when they use jargon that they make up on the spot. Um, and is that the and that is apparently it. Do I not have a questions? I thought I had a questions. Yeah, yeah, no, here. No, that's it. I, I must have, oh, the laptop died, right. Okay, well, that is it for the presentation. Um, I have one glorious little thing to leave you with. This is an example of some of our content. Um, we're trying to satirize bullying, so. This false advertising segment brought to you by Satire. Now, the use of humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices. Used with permission, the Oxford Dictionary. Not Oxford Waterloo! Are you listening to this station as the only sound wafting through empty hallways of a forsaken high school? Are you still trapped in your locker as your fellow academic peers enjoy advanced biology? Then you need Locker Lube! Apply a thin coat of Locker Lube to the inside of your steel or plastic locker every Sunday night and a liberal amount to your arms each school morning. Remember, being bullied is your fault! <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, just, you know, common, wholesome family entertainment. <laughs> um, yeah, questions? All right. Is the, uh, hey, the mic is on, cool. Um, back on the actual piracy side of things, I, I, it's so nice that all this is legal now, but um, a couple of years ago there was a government shutdown because there was some bickering about budgets. And I happened to be looking for some information about like radio licensing at that time. I went to the FCC website, and in place of the normal FCC website, there was just this letter from the director of the FCC uh, to all the employees basically saying, don't come to work. We can't pay you. You're not allowed to work. Mm -hmm. During those couple of days of, of a government shutdown, is it free-for-all piracy again? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's a funny thing. I mean, you know, having, having done radio piracy and having done uh, the power of uh, having worked with a lot of a lot of radio stations I mean there there is an amazing free-for-all of piracy in, in a couple cities uh, right now I mean in New York we, you know we just saw uh, David Gorin's great uh, presentation yesterday uh, you know there's close to a hundred pirates around New York uh, right now that you could listen to you know, a lot of them from immigrant communities uh, a lot of them in different languages and, you know, truthfully, low power FM is no solution for them and what they're trying to do. Uh, you know, there were never going to be enough frequencies for, for all that to be going on. And, um, you know, what, what it comes down to with piracy is, is a question of, like, who is, the FCC does not have the resources to go around chasing down pirates. You know, they don't have listening posts. 24-7 on every frequency all across the country. So they rely on complaints. And so really, with a lot of pirates, you know, if no one ever complains, they will never get caught uh, because that's, that's just sort of how it works. Uh, you know, there, there are certain, uh, even if people do complain, you know, there's the, the limited resources to actually go and, and catch them all. I, for, for me personally, uh, the reason that I, I moved, first of all, I saw the way that uh, that it was going to go and that like a lot of the best frequencies, the most truly viable ones, uh, were going to be taken up and start being used by, by legitimate low power FM radio stations. And I thought that, and, and I also had a lot of experience while running the pirate station of people that I really wanted to be on the air, people that I thought had like really important things to say, really interesting voices. Um, you know, they would come, they would train with our station, they would start like learning how to use all the equipment. And then like the day before it was time for them to start on the air, they were, they were kind of like chicken out. They would be like, oh man, like, I, you know, my visa's kind of screwed up. I, like I can't be here when they kick down the door and start like running around. Now that's not everyone. That's certainly not the hundred Brooklyn pirates that are out there right now. But that was my experience of like dealing with a lot of really pretty cool people that I, I really thought should have a voice. 
and that this is the sort of thing that, you know, if we could win a reform that w would actually, like, make people able to be on the air, it was, it was super worthwhile to do it. So, um, you know, there's always these kinds of, there are these moments, and, you know, that's one thing, you know, for, you know, from what I was talking about before, that's something that lawyers can do an incredible job of, is, like, sort of creating these moments when it's not really clear what the law is and whether the law as it stands is, is constitutional, is, 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 can be enforced the way it is. And, and that's what created the one pirate boom that I was really part of. Um, so yeah, there, there are always these kind of moments when, uh, when piracy does work, you know, when, when, when it's the best option, it's the best, it's the best uh, thing to do. Very cool. Um, so, so speaking of things that may have just become legal, um, or maybe not so illegal, uh, HD radio was this whole patent and intellectual property encumbered mess that they managed to get on the air. And then just uh, two years ago, a couple of uh, like cybersecurity companies decided they were going to re-implement this uh, open source so that they could generate like malformed HD radio payloads and try to audit the software in receivers. But what this means is that there's now HD radio encoders sitting on GitHub. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking you were saying, you know, so there's like 40, 50, 60 usable frequencies in a market and maybe 100 pirates out there. And so if you were to have, you know, two or three HD channels tacked onto each one of those, there would be room for everyone. That's so cool. That's like, that's a really great idea. I mean, when HD radio came out, it was this stupid mess. It was, the, it was the worst idea that you possibly could have come up with. Because basically, there was a digital audio implementation in Europe um, that made a whole lot more sense. It was called DRM. DAB, yeah, or, or there were a couple of different ones, the Digital Radio Mondial and whichever. And like the idea was, like when you digitize like a formerly a analog medium, you can get about five times more content into the same amount of bandwidth because the inherent efficiencies of, of digital. But when they told that to the American broadcasters, they were like, wait, no, that, that's a terrible idea. What, that, how are we going to fill that all up? And, and th what their problem was, and one of the things about it was that it was uh, broadcast in these pods of like five stations and all the stations would end up being equal. Well, American broadcasters are like, wait a second, are you telling me I spent $50 million for my station and like, you know, $3 million for my 400 foot tower and then I'm going to be put next to like some dinky 100 watt low power FM and we're going to have equal coverage? No way, that's not going to happen. And, and so what they did was we need a digitization that maintains the existing property relations between the haves and the have-nots on the FM bands. And for sure, we don't want any new entrants to get into it. So they came up with this crazy system called uh, IBOC, in-band on-channel, um, sort of cre like putting gears within gears of, of trying to, like, to, to shoehorn digital signals in, but with really almost no benefit whatsoever to the consumer uh, because your average radio consumer, they're, they're listening in their car, so they can't actually hear the difference between FM quality sound and what they claim to be CD quality sound. You just, like, over the noise of the engine, you, you wouldn't hear that difference. And, uh, and they made one or possibly two extra channels available, but only to the existing broadcaster the one that's already uh, on the air, they would get a second channel that most of the time they didn't know what to do with. I think the cleverest idea I heard was that NPR was going to start doing like a pledge drive free version of their content. Um, so I think they've done that in a couple places. Um, but, uh, but the other thing about it was it was entirely proprietary software. So no one could look in. And that was adopted as the official um, you know, as, as the official FM uh, implementation of, of digital radio in the United States, something that no one could even look inside and figure out how it, how it worked. And not only that, you had to pay uh, licensing fees to use the software, not only for the transmitters, but even for the receivers. So the whole thing was, was a stupid mess, and most people have never heard of it, because who wants to spend, you know, uh, $200 on a radio that's already that doesn't really do anything that your old radio didn't already do. 
um, that has basically all the same stations and doesn't really sound any better. So um, I wasn't aware of, of, of that crack, and it's super cool that someone did it, because, uh, you know, so that people can play around with it. And, uh, you know, I mean, the problem remains that you're still, IBOC is dependent on being inside the main signal of, of, of an existing FM station. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how you would implement it to get it into the hands of all the Haitians, uh, but I, it's a great step that someone figured out the technology part of it. So that was, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm monopolizing the mic. There's nobody else in line here, but um, so I've done a fair bit of like scanning around the, the HD channels on the dial back in Detroit where I live, and there's a couple of stations that have like, you know, the HD1 is a mirror of the analog signal. The HD2 is typically like an intern in a studio like practicing. Mm -hmm. And then if they have three, they're like, they're taking any random thing they can find and putting it on the air. And and it's it's great. It's like psychic talk radio shows and all weird shit. But, um, but what I was thinking is, if you've got you know 30 community groups that are vying for one or two LPFM stations, it seems like the, the, the time is ripe for LPFM HD to give three or four of them streams. And I guess that means nobody's doing it yet. So somebody in this room, step up. Very cool. Hi. Um, oh. So I guess I have the uh, I was starting as a computer hacker, and in college, I ended up just falling into the role of engineer at the radio station, and fell in love with it. Um, a very big radio station, like 3,400 watts, covers wow. a whole big area. I was, uh, my question is about, I heard you mention HD radio encoders on GitHub. Um, Integrating those with uh, a very old analog broadcast chain. Um, has anyone, I mean, has anyone done this? Like, are there restrictions on, are there technical restrictions on, I mean, because when we looked into HD radio, like, and yes, what a mess. Uh, but there was very cost prohibitive too for a small, a shoestring budget college station. Right. So I'm just wondering if, like, the station could, like, the college station would love to use those A-B channels and fill them up. There's more than enough demand from, like, students and community members to run their own shows. Um, so it would just be amazing if there was a more affordable way to, uh, you know, get them into the 21st century. Yeah, well, that's really cool. The, I, I only know of one low-power FM station that's actually done HD, and uh, unfortunately, like with LPFM, you're only starting with 100 watts, and so what HD does is it, it puts like either 1% or it's coming soon, I guess it's 10%, so it, you're allowed to do a 10% or 10-watt 10 signal, which doesn't get you much, you know, with LPFMs, but to the extent that there are cool stations like existing stations that are looking for stuff to do with their content, I, I think it's a great idea to, to use something like the GitHub version. I, the, the, the HD company, uh, Ibiquity, um, they'll charge you a lot of money for it, and so I've generally thought of it as like really not worth the trouble. Also, there's a problem of receiver penetration. I mean, there's just, I mean, one of the reasons uh, I alluded to this before, like, why is it that people are still listening to FM when they have so many choices? I mean, with internet radio, you can listen to something from any range, anywhere around the world. With podcasting, you can, you know, you can listen to your favorite program at any time, uh, so you're not limited. So, I mean, there are all these great innovations, but still 53% of listening time is spent with FM. And I, I do think um, there's a couple reasons for it. Um, some of them good reasons, some of them bad reasons, you know, but uh, one big one is that a lot of the FM listening is shifting into people's car. People are spending more and more time in their commutes, and so they're spending a lot of time in their cars. And a lot of people, like me, have old cars. You know, if you have a newer car, it's like it's more connected with, you know, Bluetooth and can connect up to your phone and all kinds of things. But because of the recession of 2007, a lot of people haven't bought new cars. And so, uh, like the, you know, I, I do think it's, 
it's not going to be forever that FM is retaining this level of, of, of relevance, but it just keeps on going. The longer we have an economy where like the super rich are making all the money and the rest of us are just making little bits and pieces, um, I, I think it's going to continue to be surprisingly pervasive. Another thing is in terms of user interface, when you compare uh, something like streaming or podcasting or whatever to FM, I mean, FM was kind of genius. I mean, there are two dials. You know, there's volume and there's channel, and that's it. And like everybody, there's like no learning curve to it. Also, there was an incredibly pervasive set of receivers. At one time, there were nine FM receivers in the average American household. I mean, just think about it. There was like one in the shower, mm -hmm. a shower radio. There was like, you know, a Walkman. There's like a boom box. There's like your little wind up. There's the one in the car. People, you know, alarm, clock. alarm clocks. There's, there's so many of them. I think now the static, the statistics gone down to about five radios are in the, in the average household. And I know in the average college dorm, there's like zero, right? But it's, it's this enormous base. I forget how many billion it is of FM radios are just sort of floating around. The other thing about them is they never break. So like if you go into a thrift store, you'll find like an old boom box and the CD player is broken, the cassette deck's broken, you know, all the other parts are broken, but the FM tuner is still working. So it's just, there's like no moving parts really and it just, just keeps on working. So in terms of like lessons for design, if you're thinking about like whether whatever medium you're you're doing is going to be around in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. FM's pretty interesting that way in how it just keeps on hanging on way beyond anyone's real thought that it would still be useful. I hope I didn't slip in one more question. Uh -huh. So remember um, in, back in pre-digital TV in the United States, there was a channel, uh, channel 6 was 87.8 megahertz and on the analog <laughs> FM radios you could turn your dial away to the left yeah. And, uh, and pick up a TV station because the standards were compatible enough. Hence the band name, TV on the Radio. And I remember there was a low power FM station, uh, either was a low power TV station or a low power FM station that got licensed for one and tried to broadcast as the other because they thought that was more commercially viable. And that, yeah. That's all, doesn't mean anything anymore now that that channel's gone. But I'm wondering, is 87.8 still, has it been repurposed or is it still available for pirates or people who can uh, try and get the FM capture effect to uh, pick up a channel there. Yeah, 87.75. I think people are still using it in a couple of places. It's kind of crazy. I think uh, with the digital transition, most of them went away, but there are still a few. And uh, they're, they're called Franken-FMs, like Frankenstein. And I actually know the guy that did the first one, a, a, a famous community radio guy, uh, Jeremy Landsman in Alaska, who actually did it uh, in, at first as a test of whether uh, low power FM stations would cause interference and it worked so well that he just he happened to have a channel 6 TV license that he wasn't using and he just put it on the air and and then he ended up like running a, a classic rock format on it it was kind of hilarious um, so I, I do think there might still be a couple of them around uh, but with the digitization of TV uh, and of the eventual sunset of even LPFM TV broadcasters, uh, LPTV broadcasters, uh, they'll probably eventually go away. So I just wanted to, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, even in 2007, I was wondering who, who was listening to FM radio. And so at the college station, we really tried to branch out by um, simultaneously streaming on the internet and also recording, uh, setting up like a, every show was, archived into an mp3 and then you just slap a feed onto that and then every show was a podcast. Um, we also like connected to the campus TV network so there was like a TV channel in every dorm that they could turn to and listen to the radio. But I really think that, um, you know, diversifying the ways people can, can listen is, is great. I, you have the studio, you're creating the content. just whether it's FM or streaming, um, there's always going to be the demand for the actual content. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's really crucial, and I, I, I tell that to all the groups that I work with. Like, FM is great right now. And, of course, you've got to be thinking about what's happening right now. But, you know, you've got to be thinking about, like, how this content can have more legs and how it can, like, how it can go into the future. 
and and where people are going to be listening to it. And the, the important thing isn't really, you know, the the transmission medium. Um, it, it it is just a, a a funny thing, the way that. Uh, that it's hanging on because certain very smart things were done in its in its early design that you know that are that are making it still really pretty worthwhile. I'll, I'll tell you there there are two projects that I've been working on the past couple of weeks that I'm thinking of, and one is uh, a group in Santa Ana. It's a Mexican cultural center uh, that has just an amazing constituency of people that are that um, that all uh, come together for this sort of. Uh, Mexican folk music school um, uh, called El Centro um, Cultural de Mexico in Santa Ana. And so they have this incredibly like loyal and connected audience. So immigrant groups are still using the hell out of the FM band. Um, another one that I'm actually going to work on after this is in Hudson Mohawk. And, and that group, um, you know, uh, is it's an independent it's an offshoot of the old independent media center and it's uh, called the sanctuary for independent media it's a it's a media arts center that's hosted in a uh, formerly abandoned church uh, in Troy New York and they do this incredible work they've kind of gone away from the old community radio model of having a different hour like the Persian hour and the Latino hour and whatever instead you know they, they have some music the rest of the day but but they focus on a lot of effort into every night at six o'clock. They have an hour of locally produced news and public affairs and content. And so they have a team of about 40 people that all they work on is making that drive time radio incredibly, incredibly good. And like going head to head with like the local public radio and the news affiliates. And like if you listen to it, like the, the level of participation uh, and the level of news gathering they're doing, it, I'm just incredibly impressed with, with what they're doing. And what they're doing is, yeah, they, they put in all these different mediums, but they're making use of that still incredibly powerful drive time FM listenership to like really do something pretty incredible. We're at time. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll be around for a little bit after. Uh, actually, we're stay tuned for the next session, which sounds really awesome about uh, about uh, recording broadcasts uh, using uh, uh, software-defined radio. So, thanks a lot for coming. And uh, any questions? Just come on up.